Good afternoon and good evening and good morning to everyone joining us today. Uh, welcome to this Chatham House Africa program webinar on uh, exploring Somali's elections in 2021-2021 uh, uh, progression or stasis in the transition. Uh, my name is Ahmed Suleiman and I am the research fellow leading on the Horn of Africa uh, at Chatham House. It's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, to this meeting. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, especially to welcome our esteemed speakers, uh, Halima Ibrahim, the chairperson of the National Independent Electoral Commission of Somalia, uh, Abd Rashid Hashi, uh, the director of the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies, and Mahad Wasuge, the executive director of Somali Public Agenda. Uh, we, inshallah, have a fantastic meeting for you uh, today, exploring the, the upcoming uh, elections. Uh, of course, the elections this year were slated to take place at one point uh, as universal elections for the first time since 1969. However, realities on the ground have prevented this expectation, uh, including, but not least, uh, a serious rift between the federal government of Somalia and several of its uh, federal member states, um, and delays to the agreement on the electoral legislation and procedures, as well as continued insecurity on the ground. Um, Instead, what we're seeing uh, implemented uh, will be the Mogadishu model, uh, an augmented indirect electoral process uh, with the senators in the upper house selected through the state assemblies and an expanded number of clan delegates uh, alongside civil society uh, electing MPs in the lower house who will of turn, in turn, of course, vote for uh, the next uh, president. Uh, as the elections begin to get underway, this event is going to look at all the dynamics taking place, uh, the, the agreed model and analysis of that and their implement, implement, uh, implications. Um, panelists are going to discuss all of these issues, including the need to uh, embed a mechanism for a dialogue between the FGS and the FMS in order to overcome significant future political disputes and ensure the implementation of policy priorities. Uh, there is a lot for us to discuss in the next hour and 15 minutes or so, and I'm delighted to welcome an esteemed panel uh, to discuss these elections. Um, we have some housekeeping points just to inform you of, and I'll keep you um, informed at the start and before we go to the question and answer. Uh, all of our attendees are going to be muted during the presentations, uh, but we would encourage you to please use that raise hand function uh, in, the, in the bottom of your screen uh, to during uh, the Q&A session in order to ask a question live. Uh, if selected, you'll be granted by myself and my colleagues the ability to unmute yourself, uh, turn your video on if you can, and ask a question. Uh, we apologize uh, if you're not able to ask your question this time. Uh, uh, we um, also uh, encourage participants to submit their questions through the Q&A box throughout the meeting. Uh, and if you can, uh, but we would prefer you please to raise, uh, use the raise hand function during the Q&A session so that you can ask your question uh, directly. And I will inform you of this again, just uh, as we, start the Q&A session. Um, this meeting is going to be on the record. This means that those who are present can, can use the information from the meeting and identify any of the speakers or participants uh, during it. Um, I'd remind you all that filming and recording of this event are not allowed without prior permission from Chatham House. Although, as always, we would very much encourage you all to tweet the event using the hashtag, hashtag CHAfrica. Um, I'll now give a brief introduction of our speakers and then turn uh, inviting them to, to begin their, their opening remarks. So Halima Ibrahim is the chairperson of Somalia's National Independent Electoral Commission. Uh, she has previously served in a variety of roles, including political affairs officer for the UN operations in Somalia and chair of Somalia's Women Leadership Initiative. She was also formerly the chair of Somalia's Civil Society Coalition, 
which advocated for the establishment of a permanent government in Somalia and the co-chair of the technical selection committee that carried out the vetting of candidates for Somalia's federal parliament and national constitutional assembly. Prior to the conflict in Somalia, uh, Madam Halima was a lecturer in agricultural sciences at Somalia's National University. Our second speaker, Abd Rashid Hashi, is the executive director of the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies, HIPS, a Mogadishu-based think tank. Abd Rashid formerly worked for the Somali government as communications director in the office of the president and also previously served as a cabinet minister in 2010. He has also worked uh, in the past for the International Crisis Group as their Somalia analyst. Uh, Mahad Wasugya is the executive director of Somali Public Agenda, a non-profit public policy and administration research organization based in Mogadishu that works to advance understanding and improve public administration and public services in Somalia uh, using evidence-based research and analysis. Mahad also occasionally teaches public policy and administration at Mogadishu University. His research interests fo focus broadly on governance, democratization, uh, civil service reform, public finance, constitutional development, post-conflict justice, and, and migration. So a huge array of interests. Um, without further ado, I will hand over to our first speaker, uh, Madam Halima Ibrahim, Welcome and thank you for your time and we look forward to hearing from you. Madam Halima, we are you are still on mute. Thank you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and good evening evening because here is evening in Mogadishu and ladies and gentlemen Thank you for thank you for allowing me to participate in this panel. This panel discussion is taking place at a crucial time in the Somali democratization journey. As you will be aware, Somali preparation for conducting election has been taking place gradually since 2000. When the first reconciliation conference was held in Djibouti and an interim clan based, based legislative body was formed. Since 2000, the international community have been investing significant resource, resources to facilitate Somalia's democratization process as a component, component of the state rebuilding process. After two decades of sustained international support, Somalia has made considerable progress towards rebuilding this political system and developing capable and effective state institutions that are key to promoting and sustaining democracy that include respect for the rule of the law, freedom of speech, respect for human rights and independent judiciary and impartial administration. That was the working toward the progress. Ladies and gentlemen, after many decades without national white police and a, an EMP in Somalia, the National Independent Election Commission was established in 2015 with a mandate to oversee the management of all electoral process throughout the Federal Republic of Somalia. Soon after its formation, NIC commissioners board began building an institutional foundation to prepare the NIC for managing effectively the 2021 election. Currently, nine commissioners, three of whom are women, are providing leadership and guidance to, for NIC to achieve its mandate. Since the NSA establishment, several critical activities has been undertaken in preparing for direct election in 2020-21. This include building the capacity of NIC commissioners and secretariat, the establishment of NIC field offices in all federal member states, 
developing the water education curriculum and supporting material identification and verification of potential water registration sites, selection of water registration model, developing the concept operation and the associate budget for outreach water registration and polling, and establishing the national security election task force. Ladies and gentlemen, this upcoming election is so crucial for Somali state building and this democratization process. It was intended to be a milestone for the Somali government and the international community as they had invested heavily in Somali for several decades to introduce and promote democracy and good governance. However, despite their past commitment, both past and present Somali political leaders show with no commitment to supporting one person, one vote election to take place. The political leader in successive government have been ignoring the fact that one person, one vote is the only mechanism for cultivating a conducive environment for promoting respect for the international principles of human rights, good governance and accountability in Somalia. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to reiterate that the clan power sharing model that Swan is again designed to be applied for the upcoming was a model initially developed in 2000 as a temporary measure to support the potential government of Somalia to prepare the country for one person, one vote election. Since 2000, when the clan was adopted, the Somali political leaders have reached a series of agreement at various conferences over the past two decades. In this agreement, the leaders expressed a command to implement direct election and to end the clan based power sharing model. Besides the leaders' agreement, there has always been considerable public support for a far, fair and credible one person, one election because ordinary Somali people sees it as the path to peace and for building a vibrant democratic in Somalia. Furthermore, it is worth nothing that any model of election that doesn't conform with the international standards and laws, the Somali public, the opportunity to exercise their rights to vote is against the Somali constitution and the various human rights convention that Somalia has ratified. Article 46 of the Professional Constitution specifically is to play the public representation system shall be open and shall allow everyone to participate. According to the Somali electoral constitutional timeline, NIC was expected to conduct one person one vote in November 2020. However, because the electoral law was not finalized on time, the NIC presented to the House of the People detailed information on two possible op options that will have allowed for conducting one person, one vote slightly beyond, beyond the constitutional time. In preparing those two options, the NIC brought into consideration the following factors in choosing those two measures, compliance with the constitution and the election law, the constitutional timeline, cost effectiveness, and COVID-19. Regrettably, in September 2020, before the House of People had debated the two models and associate time frames, we presented the Somali leaders adopted an indirect model. The leaders' decision to promote clan power sharing caused dismay for the NIC, Somali people and the international community that have been investing resources to restore the Somali public universal rights to public participation. As the deadline for conducting the indirect election is now approaching, it is increasingly becoming evident that the implementation of the indirect clan model adopted by the leaders is likely to go beyond the proposed time frame in the NIC proposed model. Additionally, 
I wanted to reiterate that besides the required additional time for implementing the application of the clan model for the upcoming election will be a receipt for Al-Shabaab domination in the parliament, the proliferation of the corruption, a renewed sub clan in fighting, the exclusion of women in the decision-making process. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to remind the Somali leaders and the international partners that it is right of every citizen to have their voice heard. There were Somali and international must know now take significant steps on the path to conducting one person one vote in, 20, 20, in 24 to 2025. Thank you, you are all welcome. Thank you very much, Madam Honeyman. Thank you so much for your insights there. And, and we look forward to hearing more from you during the, the question and answer session. Um, Abdur Rashid, uh, I now turn to you for your presentation. Again, thank you very much for, for joining us and for your time today. Hi, good evening. Uh, thank you very much, Ahmed, for the invitation. Um, I would like to start by saying that we as the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies have published a number of studies and reports on the election, last of which was about a couple of days ago, commentary, which uh, if this discussion is not enough for me to cover, one can read that. I also would like to pay tribute to Madam Halima and her commission for the work they have done for Somalia and to push for one person, one, one person, one for the election. But unfortunately, as Madam Halima said, uh, on you know, September you know, this year, Somali political actors, especially at the federal level and the federal member state level agreed to uh, uh, use the 2016 model, slightly modified by the 2016 model. So I would like to just go back a little bit to 2012 when President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud was elected. Then he promised he will uh, conduct one person, one vote within his mandate. Three years on his mandate by 2015 July, the Hassan Sheikh Mohammed administ administration understood they won't be able to conduct one person, one vote. And then they invited uh, political actors, especially at the federal level, regional level, and the, and, the, and the parliament to come up with an indirect election. That election was called enhanced legitimacy process, which more or less uh, called for 51 clan individuals from different clans to vote for their MPs. And, uh, you know, uh, those elections to happen at the regional level, at the capitals of the regional states like Puntulan, where I am now, and Chubalan, and things like that. Unfortunately, the 2016 model was basically uh, very flawed. Uh, the corruption was just uh, beyond uh, description. It was just like, you know, uh, Rigging spree, uh, and Somalis were aghast the outcome of that election because uh, there was no fair competition, there was no uh, oversight, conflict of interest was was rife, uh, and uh, horror stories were reported across from the regions where sometimes individuals were told to come to a, mo a voting uh, place. Well, actually, the vote was taking place somewhere else, somewhere said we are locked in a room and the election took place. Some brought their own drivers and their sisters and their nephews to act as a contestant and then they won the election and a lot of cash also exchanged hands. So the 2016 model, which unfortunately the current political actors agreed to adopt in 2020, was known universally to be uh, highly corrupted, to just say uh, bluntly. For Fortunately or unfortunately, it produced a new leader, which uh, Muhammad Abdullah Farmacho, the current president in July, in, in February 2017. And most of the Somali citizens welcomed his election. He was an outsider. He was not part of the people who designed that 2016 enhanced legitimacy model, but he won the election with line slide. Now, unfortunately, again, his administration and the regional leaders agreed to adapt the slightly, modif slightly modified version of the 2016 uh, you know, electoral model, where instead of 51 individuals now, 101 person will vote for each MP, 
and the election will take place two cities instead of one city at the regional level. And individuals who represent Somaliland will be elected now as then in Mogadishu. In our latest commentary on the election as heritage, we outlined, outlined about the number of issues we have with this current setup. Number one, as in 2016, there is a high chance that there, that there will be no enough competition, no good competition among the actors and regional leaders and, and, and the federal level for Somaliland MPs can, as they wish, uh, help whoever they want to be elected. So election to be you know, credible, Somalis to get a good government or the government they deserve, there should be a fair competition. And this model as in 2016 will allow anybody who's in charge to elect whoever they want. And the signs are all, all over the world because uh, the federal leadership and the regional leadership started appointing their own staff and their friends and their supporters to manage the election. And the whole world knows now, you know, conflict of interest and how it works. You cannot appoint your chief of staff to, when you are a candidate to run the election. And it happened at the federal level and also at the regional level. And, and not only those, but they also appointed diplomats and civil servants and security, people who are associated with the security agencies. And we have a serious problem with that. And we think we should not have an election where people who are contesting are also managing the election. In 2016, there were a sort of integrated you know, commission, a team led by Professor Ahmed Ismail Samantar. Now there is no integrated team that looks into if something crazy is happening during the election. Also the Somaliland uh, representatives were uh, you know, manipulated in 2016 and now they have been crying loudly, including the speaker of the upper house and others, that the way this is designed will result, uh, you know, the, the federal leadership designing and basically helping themselves to get their friends and their supporters get become MPs, which will, in result, you know, as a result, will lead to, you know, them getting elected. So, uh, although, as Halima said, time is actually running fast. Uh, in 2016, the first MP was elected in November 5th. So now we are in February 17th. So 12 days ago, he, his mandate expired. He was elected in this city in Garoui, where I am now, on November 5th, 2016. Now he's still a couple of days ago, maybe they were voting for, for things at the parliament, but some of the MPs, their time has, is up. Therefore, we recommend the international community and the Somali political actors to come, you know, to come to their senses and make sure Somalia gets, uh, you know, at least acceptable and, and credible indirect election. We all know now in Ethiopia, there are problems we are all talking about. It started with the mandate of the federal government ending and the Tigray, Tigray region basically doing whatever they want. If the mandate ends in February 8th in Somalia without an agreement on the model, uh, candidates for the presidency and I believe we, we have lost Abdul Rashid uh, at the moment. We'll try and reestablish uh, his connection if we can. Um, perhaps in the interim, um, I can ask Mahad uh, if you would uh, unmute yourself and, and, and begin to, uh, to give your presentation, if, if you don't mind. Thank you, Ahmed. And, uh the panelists and for this important discussion. Uh, I would like to focus my uh, introductory remarks in uh, the Mogadishu model that is going to be implemented uh, uh, this time. <clears throat> After a series of consultative meetings between the leaders of the federal government and the federal member states in Dusumareb and Mogadishu, the elect an electoral model which is a replica and a slight improvement of the 2016 indirect election model was agreed on September 17th uh, this, uh, uh, this year in Mogadishu after five days of uh, discussion. The both houses of the parliament uh, approved the agreement on the 26th of September 
in a joint session. Moreover, the technical details of the election were consented by the federal government and federal member state leaders on October 2nd, and uh, the president has uh, lately signed the agreement on the 12th of November uh, this month. The agreements define an indirect election process with six main characteristics. The first is for each of the 275 seats of the House of the People uh, of the Federal Parliament, an electoral college of 101 and delegates will be selected to vote for the seat. Uh, second, each seat of the House of the People will be assigned to one location, one election location, including two locations in each federal member state and one in Mogadishu. Third, candidates for the House of the People seats will pay 10,000 in fee, uh, US dollars to register. Candidates for the upper house will also pay 20,000 in registration fee. Uh, fourth, federal member state uh, legislators will uh, vote on the seats of the upper house uh, uh, members, total in 54. Fifth, the election will be managed by a two-tiered system, including a federal indirect election implementation team and state indirect election implementation team who will cooperate to implement the process. And finally, 21 member independent district resolution committee will manage compliances relating to candidacy and delegate selection, voting process, outcome of the elections, and the conduct of uh, election management committees. There are four limitations of this uh, election design. The first is the economics of the election. And the federal uh, indirect election uh, design uh, uh, is quite expensive. It will be an elite election. Uh, the non-refundable election registration fee, which is 10,000 for the House of the People and 20,000 for the Upper House are quite high and locks out many potential candidates who could not afford the registration fees. In 2016, the registration fee for the House of People was 5,000 and also 2,500 for women candidates. This will now be doubled and there is also no reduction in the registration fee for women. The registration fee does not reflect the economic states of the country it systematically excludes a significant portion of the society, mainly the youth and the women, who would likely join, who would like to join the legislative bodies because they cannot afford this money. Therefore, the upcoming election would be uh, contested by a privileged few. The second limitation is the women representation. According to the agreed process, there are no reserved seats for women according to uh, each woman candidate will compete with other male and female contenders for each seat. This would most likely reduce the current 24% uh, and, uh, of women representation in both chambers of the parliament. The third limitation is uh, the time frame and, uh, and the tasks ahead. The election activities often require a tentative schedule that can cater for the time gaps and unforeseeable time lapses. The federal government and the federal member states agreed a tentative deadline for the federal indirect elections. According to the agreed timeline, uh, the federal and uh, state election implementation teams was ideally to be appointed between the 10th and the 20th of October last month, train the committee between the 20th and 31st of October, prepare the election uh, electoral delegates and police centers in November, elect the upper house members in the first 10 days of December, elect the members of the House of the People between the 10th and the 27th of December, 2020, and elect the speakers of the two chambers of parliament, as well as the president between the 1st January and the 8th February, 2021. The appointment of the state level committees were not yet completed as of today. This is evident that the agreed timeline was not realistic. The fourth limitation is the election management. This election will be managed by federal and state level election implementation teams. Most of the recently appointed members of these bodies have no prior experience in managing an election. 
from the perspective of the commissioners and given the amount of money involved in the electoral process, membership of the federal and the state level, uh, members uh, of this uh, election implementation teams provide this opportunity for corruption. Some candidates would most likely deprive commissioners in order to win the election as the 2016 experience shows. That the 2020-21 elections will be managed by federal and state level bodies, similar to the 2016 process, is another main weakness of the electoral election design. There are three main challenges currently faced by this election. The first is the recently appointed commissioners uh, were publicly challenged by the opposition candidates who expressed that these bodies are not neutral. This is why Jubilan and Guntran have not yet released the list of the state level election members, uh, committee members. Second, the management of the Somaliland seats is very critical and equally sensitive issue. The upper house chair and some opposition groups disdained the appointment of the Somaliland Commission by the office of the prime minister. Since Somaliland seats will be elected in Mogadishu, due to political reasons, they face potential manipulation from the political actors and even by some of the Somaliland politicians who are well connected. Third, the Gather region, where 16 seats were planned to be elected, uh, poses a, another challenge. Chipalan president has recently questioned the troops in the Gather region and if the select uh, election of the parliament allocated in the Garbahari district is possible. Going forward, the federal government and federal member state leaders need to come together and address concerns that relate to the election uh, commissions and the Gather region. The commission for the management of the Somaliland seats should be given the independence it deserves in order to minimize attempts to manipulate these seats. The election for these seats could be held in an agreed neutral venue. Finally, representation for women and the realization of the quota needs more efforts and political commitment from all the stakeholders. The federal level and state level election bodies should coordinate with the clan and uh, with the clans and promote the concept of rotational allocation of seats to women among the subclans. This is uh, seen as the most effective way of securing the 30% quota and, and or even more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mahad, for very uh, succinctly elucidating, I guess, some of the key differences between this election and, and, and the the one previously and and the challenges that we're key challenges that we're seeing during uh, the upcoming electoral time frame um i will take us to questions and answer i see that um abdul rashid has managed to join us again and um we will monitor your connection abdul rashid as we continue with the q a um again i would encourage we see some questions in the q a box which is great uh, but I encourage everybody to use the raise hand function uh, if they can, uh, please, uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, to during this Q&A session in order to ask a question live so we can uh, get you up and, and, and if you're granted that opportunity, we will unmute you and, and, and you can introduce yourself and ask your question. Apologize in advance for anyone that's not able to ask their question at this time. Uh, we will, of course, also monitor the Q&A box throughout the meeting and, and pick the best of those questions. But please, uh, emphasizing, as I did at the start, do use the raise hand function now uh, and during the Q&A session so that you can ask your question uh, directly. As, as I said at the start, this, is, uh, uh, this meeting is very much on the record, so we can use uh, the information in the meeting and any speakers or participants' information um, uh, during during this meeting. Okay, uh, we'll go directly to uh, Q&A now and um, I'm seeing a few hands up. Uh, so I will go with the, the first on our list. Uh, Abdi Halim Abdullahi, please welcome. Do introduce yourself, uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh... 
Hello, uh, my name is uh, Abdi Hakim Abdullahi. I live in Norway. I'm a student uh, writing a master research on democracy building in Somalia, especially Somalia elections. Uh, my question is uh, we are uh, just uh, talking about, and it's how, who decided this hefty registration of uh, the candidates of Lao House and Upper House? Who, who decided? Is it the president? Is it the Somali national election? Is it the parliament? Who decides that kind of hefty registration? P. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Talk so much, Abdi Halim. Talk for small. Thank you very much. I'll take another round of a couple of questions. Uh, so if we move to uh, Abdi Garad. Uh, Abdi, please, if you could unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. Abdi, are you able to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, I'll give you an opportunity to do so, Abdi Garad. Otherwise, I will move on. OK. Uh, Muhammad Sharif. Muhammad, uh, you have your hand raised. Please do uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. Well, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my name is Muhammad Sharif Muhammad. And I'm studying international relations in uh, Turkey. So I would like to ask this question to both of uh, the, both of our uh, guests. So uh, the, the 2016 election, uh, the Kalan delegates who are uh, supposed to uh, elect or select the uh, members of parliament, especially the House of the People, were 51. And now they are uh, more than 100 or just 101. So the question that I want to ask is, uh, as we understand, the previous election was married by corruption. So the increase of number, we can just predict that this election will be uh, more corrupted than the previous one. So uh, there is no difference between the two elections, but this uh, election will be more corrupted as uh, money, much money will be invested in it. So, where will we, will we go from here? I don't think this election will be uh, more transparent or uh, the result of the uh, election will be more credible than the previous one. So what's the future holds for Somalia, the next elections? Thank you very much for your question, Mohammed. I'll take a third question uh, and then we will uh, get some answers from our three panelists. Um, I will go with Fortuna. Fortuna DeBarco, uh, if you are able to unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask your question. You hear me? Fortuna, welcome. Yes, we can hear you just about. Uh, please do, do ask your, introduce yourself and ask your question. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Fortuna. I am the head for the Canada Affairs in Ethiopian Embassy to UK and Northern Ireland. Uh, I would like my my not a question. I, I I want to reflect on the role of Amazon with regard to forthcoming election. Uh, Is there first, anything anything in particular, Fortuna, that you would uh, with regards to that? With, with regard, anyway, we acknowledge that the agreement was reached on the basis of a Somali-led and Somali-owned dialogue that will help for the 2010-21 electoral process to be free, fair, transparent, and democratic progress going forward. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're got, you're got... starts yeah. gradual drawdown. Late 2008, its role in creating a stable security environment for the smooth holding of election over the coming months remains still significant. Therefore, the provision of logistical support. But you know, I, I apologies, okay. I have to interrupt you because you're you're coming across quite patchy. So I think uh, we get the yeah, gist yeah. of your question. Um, we get the gist of your question, question around the, ro the role of Amazon. I will ask. I'll ask our uh, panelists. 
we understand, I think, what you're, what you're asking here about reflecting on the role of Amazon, particularly in the security and stability of the country, and with the gradual drawdown that we've seen of African Union troops and, and what implication that has for the Somali elections uh, this year. Okay, thank you very much. I will, I will ask, uh, perhaps I will ask uh, to delegate the questions uh, a little bit. Um, uh, perhaps um, if I if I turn uh, to Halima first, Halima, would you would you like to give your impression and your views on the registration fees for parliamentarians, as Mahad uh, outlined, on in both the lower house and the upper house? You have extremely hefty re registration fees, non-refundable, as I understand, uh, which are li not only limiting in terms of you know, certain sectors of society, including youth and women and others, but could, uh, could really, I think, you know, limit participation in the election and the nature of the, the, the parliament uh, moving forward over the next four years or so. It would be great to get your thoughts on that. Thank you very much. And first of all, I wouldn't call this an election and I wouldn't accept a free and fair and credible election. This is a selection. It is a process of selection. Few people will select who they want, those candidates that, 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 that are competing. So it's not election, it's getting few people. That few people has been selected by Small, uh, another few people, and then they will choose their candidates. So it's a selection, not election, because election has rules, regulations, responsibilities, procedures, which are very different uh, the one that we are doing now. And the registration fee, yes, it's high. And it was high even last time, 2016, but it was half of it. It was 5,000 and 10,000, now it's, and 10,000 and 20,000. And I think it is a method of limiting the people who, are, who want to, can, to be a candidate. And everybody cannot be an MP. And it's, it looks like the only job that we have now that you can go and check for, it's, 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 it's seeking to become MP. So everybody wants to become an MP. And, and on the other hand, it's also um, the operational and, and, and finance for the election. And it is not, um, we know how the government is limited and in regards to when we are talking financial support. And also international community, and they don't have that appetite that they had before when we were talking about one person, one vote election. And so that is, it is, it's just making limitation to those who, who, and we know everybody, everybody who has to money will come and pay and, and, and compete, thinking that they can get it back, that money, when they get the power and, 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 and get it back. And so in my understanding, it is minimizing the number of the con candidates for, for, for that money. And another thing is um, this agreement, because we have been working for one person, one election, and there was an electoral law uh, that the parliament passed. It. it was saying that you can, since we don't, we haven't done a census, we haven't count our people, census, help us um, to divide um, the seats to the constituents. When you know the number of the population who are living there, then you say that number of seats, and um, they have the right to get that number of seats. Since we don't have that, our um, 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 constituency seat is, is the 275, which is divided by Kalam. So you know, where these 275 seats could go. But we needed to do voter registration in order to know who is going, who can vote. That's that is our plan. And now the seats are there, the 275 are there, but the, the, this agreement 
deprive the Somali people to have at least, not to have at least and uh, to know very well the constituency, but at least to vote that every Somali could go and vote where they can. They have deprived that our leaders. And the leaders, they came together, the federal member states and the federal government, and they designed an agreement one by one to, how to do it. That agreement was put in the, the joint parliament and they agree all of them. They approved that agreement. And the leaders, they got what they wanted because the agreement was designed by themselves. When it was written, nobody said, no, this we don't want, you can't do this. Everybody was shaking and collapsing and the parliament gave the approval and they are start exercising what they what what they write to their hands, and and I I I I could agree to work so the um, the woman issue yes the woman issue is critical, and I don't think that we will accept to get twenty four percent that the woman has now. That's one thing that to agree, but formation of the committee, it is in the agreement. And they can do what they want. Nobody is going to stop because it is an agreement. But one thing, another thing that I agree with, with Suga is um, that any time that they see something is not going well, to, that they have to come together and then sort it out what is missing. That is, uh, I, I would agree. But from now, in 2016, we know who the committee where they were coming. They were coming from the offices of the federal member state office, ministries of, of, of uh, ministries of planning or other ministries or minister of interior were included the committee. The federal government were nominating whether the office of the president, whether the office of the prime minister or the office of the parliament, they were uh, uh, nominating their people. One thing that I am grateful to, to 2016, the leaders, they accepted to form um, women ambassadors, women who are civil society, women who are not from the government, but outside the government, and it, it called goodwill ambassadors. They were going around and, and, and following what is happening. And they were pushing and they, they were safeguarding uh, the quota, the third quota for, for women, that is missing. The integrity committee, I would, I would like to correct um, Abdirashid. The, the integrity committee was formed through the election of the president. When the, the president was not now, it was not created now, it was created in, in the election of the president. And it is a good thing also, if it's possible to, to create it now, but it was not something existed during the process. It existed only and the election of the of the president of that integrity committee. And it is not what I was expecting. It is not what I practice that I know. And what, another thing that I want to correct to um, where Suga was, um, 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 this committee doesn't have any idea or experience of election. There was no, none who had experience all the indirect selection that we were doing from now, there was no existed a committee who had experience on election. In 2002, Alif, I was president of the technical committee who was selecting, and it was my first time to work in election. I, I, we, we did not have any and, and, and knowledge. 2016, same people who doesn't have any knowledge of election was, was formed, and now it's, it's the same. The ball is on their um, hands. They set it a rules and they are following their rules. I don't know why we are shouting now. We didn't shout before. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Halima. Um, I, we have a question, I think, on uh, the role of Amazon uh, in the upcoming election and, and the importance of the security environment. Abdur Rashid, if I can turn to you maybe to, to reflect on that question. Uh, thanks, uh, Ahmed. Well, Amazon, um, most, of most of the elections happening at the regional states, 
and Amazon is not in Buntland, it's not in other places. Uh, and they are also in some other states. And also in Mogadishu, they are providing security for the Somali government. And sometimes the election may take place, or last time some elections took place at the, at, at the airport. So Amazon is helpful, uh, but you know, since this happening at the regional level, most of it, I think the role is, uh, is not as direct as maybe the, the questioner was, was asking. So just can, can I ask you maybe to expand a little bit on how you see the security being upheld during the election? Perhaps, I mean, given the environment where you have uh, a drawdown of, you know, a gradual drawdown of Amazon forces, you have Somali force generation that has been taking place, but at, perhaps not at the required level when with, uh, I guess, the consistency and uh, uh, the unification uh, that, that was set out, uh, you know, in 2017 with the uh, Somali national security architecture. Um, so, I mean, I guess my question is, you have an expanded election with an expanded number of candidates and expanded number of locations, including within state capitals, as well as, you know, outside of the capitals. How, how are these elections going to be successfully secured? I think security issues is, is a very pertinent uh, issue. Uh, Al Shabaab in the past targeted, you know, uh, elders who were selecting uh, the the, the voters and, and, and the electors, and also some of those electors were were hungry in the past. So, and as you said, now there are you know, about seventeen thousand or maybe like 100, uh, one hundred, one or one time is two hundred twenty-five MPs. It's a lot of people. So definitely, there will be the security question is a serious question. Uh, but it's, I think, uh, where Amazon is, like Chubalan and Southwest here and, and Hirshabel, uh, they could definitely help. And where, like Buntilan and other places, I think the security agencies there can handle the security issue. But generally, insecurity can also come uh, if the, the actors, the political actors, uh, it, has, it has been mentioned uh, that the federal government and the federal member states agreed on a model. But a critical, uh, you know, opposition groups, especially former presidents, uh, new presidential candidates, have been loudly saying, "We are not uh, going to accept uh, this uh, model that suits uh, the individuals who have designed it." So my worry is, if uh, time, you know, runs out, or if uh, and, you know, this model that has not been agreed by the, you know, presidential candidates, about 11 of them, including the former prime minister, has said they will not accept this. You know, so I think we should not uh, ignore uh, the risk associated with if uh, the, you know, the, the people who will contest the election or who are interested to contest the election, if they refuse and start their own parallels, this could, this could be, a, you, know, a, you know, a gimmick or it could be true, but I think we should not ignore that. And, and overall, uh, in Africa, insecurity increases if the election, um, you know, practice and processes are not agreed. And we definitely, you know, ask, um, I was saying this before I was cut off, that, you know, uh, if the federal member states and the regional governments agreed, that's good. But the other actors in Mugosu should not be ignored and they should be brought to the table. So their issues are addressed and then uh, in, in spite of the time running out and in spite of the weaknesses and the problems we have mentioned about this process, it's still election has to happen because in the last 20 years, at the end of, of each mandate, at least we elected a president and the previous ones were peaceful and we need this one to be peaceful, but corrections could be made and I think we still have time to, to make fixes. Thank you very much, Abdul Rashid. Uh, that brings us to the final question of the round of for you, uh, Mahad, if, if you will, uh, you know, given as well, I guess, your recent focus uh, in Somali public agenda on the lessons learned from 2016. Uh, the question from Mohammed about, you know, the clan delegates being expanded. Um, uh, and, and, and also, if, if, if you can, you know, adding to that, is there any more clarity around the role of civil society representative clan delegates to uh, you know, alleviate to offset potential corruption. Do you see the expansion of the number of clan dele delegates, even though it's not ideal in terms of, uh, you know, one person, one vote, as potentially, you know, <laughs> fueling further corruption or actually as I think what was, you know, the 
design process uh, around it, you know, an expanded number of delegates would mean that corruption perhaps had less of an impact. So your thoughts on that and then perhaps how civil society's role in, in influencing that process might, might also contribute. Uh, thanks, Ahmed. I think that's a good question. And uh, the fact that uh, the, the delegates, the, the, the electoral delegates were increased from 51 to 101 does not mean that uh, uh, the corruption will decrease. And in fact, it, it will be the reverse. The expectation is that the, the corruption will increase. And uh, many of these people uh, are taking this uh, as a risk and they will most likely uh, uh, demand some money. So the burden will go to the uh, uh, candidates who have already paid a heft money of registration and then are required to be another uh, 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 private the, the, uh, the, the delegate. So I agree with Mohammed that uh, uh, the fact that the number was increased does not mean that uh, the election, uh, the, the, the corruption is minimized. The second thing is the role of the civil society. This is one of the blurred uh, uh, things in the, this electoral process. Many people are confused about this. The initially, the agreement on the 17th of September uh, outlined that uh, the civil society will play a role in vetting and uh, uh, being part of the selection of the clan uh, delegates. But if you look at the uh, technical details agreed on the 2nd of November of October, uh, there is no role uh, for the civil society. And this is a, a bit tricky one. Uh, there, is a, there is no agreed definition of who, who qualifies civil society and what civil society can, can play in, in, in a clan already designated seat that it is clan members are supposed to decide who is the winner and, and vote for it. So it's a bit ambiguous. Uh, initially, uh, uh, the feeling is that the international community was pushing for more transparent and, and inclusive process and that they introduced the, 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 the concept of civil society being part of this process. But the, the, the technical details does not uh, actually uh, give any role to the civil society to be part of this process. Thank you very much, Mahad. Uh, we'll move to a second round of questions. Uh, I'll start by asking uh, Faiza Ali, please, Faiza, if you would unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. Welcome. Faiza, are you able to join us? Are you able to unmute yourself? Ah, here we are. Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my question is for Abdul Rashid. Um, a Could you please introduce yourself, Faiza? Sure. My name is Faiza. Uh, my background is in nonprofits um, and international law as well. Um, my question is for Abdul Rashid. Um, the recent HIPS briefings um, key policy for government was to make sure that committees are bipartisan and not simply made up of um, loyalists to the government. I was wondering how this recommendation could be implemented realistically um, with the involvement of international players, um, where, where sometimes involvement is useful, but often not, um, and who propel highly compromised individuals in the process. Um, so I was wondering how you saw that playing out in light of, of all those actors on the scene. Thank you very much, Faisal. Um, I'll ask Mohammed Amar as well. Please, you have your hand raised if you could unmute yourself and uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. Can you hear me? Hello? Mohammed, now we can hear you. Welcome. Oh, thank please, you very please much. Ask question. Please thank do you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Ahmed, and and also the panel. Um, my question is relating to <clears throat> uh, the fee, the registry MB, seems quite huge, and as the panel acknowledged, it bars a lot of uh, useful people who could be make a difference in the country direction, and. Is there any possibility uh, to oversee somehow those funds which ultimately will be 
people who are becoming the MB will be. Uh, as we know, currently there is a oversee of the corruption in a, a international financial organization such as the World Bank and IMF. So this is a, another extension obviously to the current co huge corruption, which is let down the country. But I also can I extend into a, in terms of the, this model, the election model, which was used quite a long time, seem is quite hopeless really. And why continue the Somali leaders are unable, whether they are the regional administration or the federal level, obviously, just going through a road which is simply going to nowhere in the country. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Mohammed, if you, oh, you've gone. I was gonna ask you to introduce yourself, but that's okay. Uh, we'll, do, we'll take that time with the next person. Uh, I'll take a third question. I'll uh, introduce, ask Claire Thomas, please, to, uh, unmute herself, introduce herself and ask a question. Hello, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I was just interested in the, the group of um, constituents or would-be constituents who are the 0.5 in the 4.5 formula. So they're often overlooked in Somalia and they lose out, I think. A lot of international observers feel that they lose out a lot. My name is Claire Thomas and I work for Minority Rights Group. And I just wanted to get the panel's views on this particular group and the fact that they're still waiting for a, um, a electoral system that, that gives them an equal share of the, sheet, the seats with, with other clan group members in Somalia and whether there is potential for the more progressive um, elements who are pushing for one person, one vote to also make common cause with the minority community members to try to push for change. Okay, thank you very much, Claire, for your question and uh, your introduction. Uh, we'll move uh, forward with those. We should have time for another round of questions as well uh, afterwards. Um, and Abdul Rashid, I think there was a question directed specifically to you uh, around the committees being bipartisan and, and how that can possibly be implemented realistically. I, I wonder if you could answer that. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Faisa. I think that's it. Uh, you know, right question, and uh, it's everybody's interest to appoint uh, electoral management teams who are credible. They will help the outcome, and they will help uh, you know whoever wins the election. So, in other settings, we will not accept it to appoint your cousins and your mother-in-law and, and you know and your, your driver to just you know uh, you know do things other people are supposed to be doing. And uh, this is not only the federal government who has been appointing, as Halima said, ministers and their officials in the past and also doing it now, but also at the regional level. You know, the most of the problems in the 2016 election have been at the regional level, where more or less the election was stolen by, you know, uh, you know aides and supporters and officials for the regional leaders. And most of the people who were, by the way, running and, and, and and, 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 and rigging the election in 2016 are not in power. All of them are not in power, maybe, you know, 99% uh, of them are not in, in power. So even rigging the process does not guarantee anybody, you know, to get reelected. So this government were advocating for the past three and a half years, almost four years, that they will, you know, uh, you know bring about one person one vote. If that cannot come, then the election that they organized this indirect election should be better than the 2016, should be somewhat credible. And, uh, you know, they just cannot ignore the speaker of the upper house who represents an important constituency in Somaliland. Even if, even as Halima said, if the letter of the agreement they themselves agreed gives them a lot of power, if the spirit is not, uh, you know, uh, accommodating all the different political actors, big and small, including as uh, uh, Ms. Thomas was saying about the minority groups, you know, Abd Hash Abdullahi and his team cannot be ignored. He's the speaker of the parliament. He represents Somaliland. He represents the community. Former presidents Hassan Sheikh and Sheikh Sharif and former president Hassan Al Khayre and host of other political actors in Mogadishu cannot be ignored. And if they are ignored, and if uh, and a process only 
five federal leaders and, and President Faramaki agreed if they go through with that, then the possibility of problems is there. And then if problems happen, then who will be responsible? So we think uh, they can go back to the drawing board. There are a lot of credible Somalis uh, at the civil society level, even former prime ministers. There are former prime ministers who are supposedly the same kind of the current president. If he appoints them, I think the opposition would have accepted them as the leader of this political process. These are credible people, known people, elder states people. You just cannot appoint you know, junior individuals, you know, uh, youth to manage this process. You need to manage the perception. You, mean, you need to manage how communities do things. And everybody should feel they have been included and accommodated. Otherwise, time will run up. And then the Somali state and the institutions that has, we spent a lot of time and effort and energy will be weakened. And as we know now in Ethiopia, the biggest problem now of growing up there had to do with mandate of the federal government, Abiy Ahmed's government ending, and the Tigray, you know, regional government doing their own things. So I am afraid and I don't want to be a bit alarmist, but small things can lead to big problems and we have a time and uh, the federal leaders and the regional leaders need to meet with the others who are not happy with the process and accommodate their genuine concerns. It's very important and it's a common sense, it's prudent and it serves everybody rather than you know, people who are just outside now. Thank you, Abdul Rashid. Alima, if I, if I may turn to you, uh, and perhaps not, uh, you know, uh, going over the same ground on the re re uh, registration fees issues, but actually, I think it was a really useful question and, and one uh, which you touched upon slightly in your previous answer. But how how can the registration fees, you know, how can there be proper oversight over these in terms of how they're implemented? And this and the broader question that was also asked about. You know why is why are we in a scenario where we don't you know have one person one vote? I know we can't answer that in in, in its totality because it's is a very big question. But why is there a persistence with this electoral model? And I think what would be really interesting from my perspective to hear you know from you of course, chair of NIEC, is you know your thoughts on the on this decision to establish and move forward uh, with a non-independent electoral body to oversee the upcoming elections. Well, thank you. Um, why um, this persistence of indirect election? I think um, there was no election in Somalia for 50 years. Um, nobody had, nobody knew about the generation who knew, maybe I am one of those, I'm the last ones. Those who are younger than me, um, election, it's not in their dictionary. They don't know. They don't know how it works. They don't know how to do it. And you know, when something is new, everything, every, everyone is scared about it because you don't have any idea what will happen. That was the problem, one. Second is one person, one vote. It may have, it may be, would have give opportunity to a lot of people who really could, could run this country. A lot of people who would have knowledge, experience, and, and who could come and, and, and really lead the country. And that's another thing. Maybe new people will come. And those who are in the, in, in the power now, and they would have been scared about that. They, they could be scared about that because they want with everyone, as Abdirashid was saying, everyone wants to come back and be an MP. If you go to the regions, the, the parliamentarian in the regional states, each of them, they would like to be a federal parliamentarian. Youth, they want to be. Women, they want to be. Everyone. And those who are sitting, the 275 who are sitting now, all of them, they want to come back. And the only knowledge that they have for election is that this process of selection. They are very close to their elders. They can ask their elders. They are very some. They are very close to the president of the federal member states, or the, the of the or the president of the federal. Everybody is running. This election of one person one vote is unknown. It's scary. Am I coming back? What is this? That was the the the, the problem. 
um, the reduction of fees, it could be, it can happen. Um, the parliamentarian, whether the, uh, the upper house or house of the people, they were there and they approved that and that um, um, agreement. And they are the ones who are paying that money. They were confident to pay that money. Last time was 5,000, now it's 10,000. For them, there's no big difference, I think. But for others, it is a big difference. It is a, a big difference. So what is, what, the whole thing is, I have to be, I have to be an MP, I have to come back. Uh, that is the, the mentality, whatever it costs, whatever it costs. Amisom, as Abdrashid said, Amisom, they have a role in the election. We worked with Somali Am and, and, and Amisom to form the National Security Election Task Force led by the commissioner of the police. And Amisom was member of it. Most of the regions there are Amisom. There are a few regions that there, Amisom are not there, especially in Putland. Um, but other, other states, they're all, they are all Amisom who could provide um, technical, technical and security work to our, our troops. So they have that role to work with them. They worked last time with them in 2016. They worked and they did really a, a good job on the security. This time is very different. Al-Shabaab is uh, more infiltrated than before. And, and, and it, is, it is really, there is a chance that they could um, get um, seats in the parliament. Uh, they could control the 101 people calling one by one and directing who to, who to choose. That, that probability there is, um, 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 it, it gives me um, scary. Nobody wanted an election because indirect election, indirect selection, corruption is easy, you pay. Now without, without the process is started, in the regions and in Mogadishu also, the electoral college has been already prepared. The elders, they divided the names. Those who are included in, in that list, they know what they want. They want the same amount or more money that they got before. And, and as Abdrashid saying, everything has to feel and be confident when they are running for election. If they are not confident, then election will not, it's not going to, to be an election, to be an selection, whatever it is now. For me, it's not election, but everybody who wants to run for, for a candidate must participate while they are, they are confident in, in, in the process. That's, I agree with him. And it happened before 2016, it's happening now. And everything is the hand in the hands of the federal member states. The, we, we know last time there was feed the federal election and committee. And in the states, there were state election commission. The feed, they did not have any power. They couldn't do anything in, in the regions. The federal state election is the one who has the power and do the work. The national and committee, they just prepare the procedures, the rules, and, and they just do that. And then they do only, they have the nomination and they give the certificate. But the real, real work, it's happening in the states. So we must be more concerned, those committee, we must, it has to be well-trained, those, those committee and besides, while this committee is sitting here in Mogadishu, or they may go in the states, but they don't have the same power as 
the state the state election. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Halima. And uh, a question for you, Bahad, around uh, you know the, the the issue then of uh, minority groups. You know the 0.5 uh, clan in, within the 4.5 formula, and um, whether or not you know the I guess minority clan members are, are extremely badly affected by that. How you can improve the rights of of those constituency members, uh, and and you know. In the future, if not now, and whether there can be some common cause between uh, different uh, clans to build a uh, consensus to move past the current system. Um, so your thoughts on that would be very useful. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, and Ahmed and, and, and Claire for the question. I think the issue of minority clans, uh, especially when it comes to representation in the parliament, it's based on uh, a clan power sharing and uh, in conglomerate of uh, clans, small number of clans were gathered, were given and half of the of the of the share of the other uh, four clans. I think it's 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 not fair for them. And uh, but in order to to get more inclusion for the uh, minorities, we we need to redefine the the current system. This is a, this is a rooted uh, system whereby. Somalia has been using for uh, over 20 years now. It has been started in, 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 in the year 2000. And, and as of today, even the, the, the one person, one vote elections uh, uh, law uh, that uh, included 4.5 in the system, which, which somehow questions whether it is one, point, one person, one, one vote or, or another indirect electoral process managed by the NIEC. So uh, this is uh, this needs redefinition. And, and I think when we redefine the uh, the power sharing system, uh, then th that could be the best time to to discuss what what kind of representation that we can have for for minorities. And, and there are a lot of uh, in minorities, it, they need to be defined. There are a lot of IDP, IDPs in Somalia. And uh, they don't get representation at also state level. So the, the discussion should also not be at federal level, but also at the state level, whereby we discuss uh, their inclusion in the in, in the in the process. And more importantly, most of the people focus more on uh, the political aspect of things. There there are a lot of rooms for inclusion. There is civil service institutions and. Uh, people rarely discuss uh, inclusion of minorities and women inclusion in the civil service. And that is why you see many people, uh, uh, you, you will not see many people uh, from the minority colonies in the civil service, at the ministries, at local governments. And that, I, I think that that discussion should be inclusive and should start from the bottom and, and up to top. Thank you very much, Mahad. Um, I, we're over time, but I, I, the, can, the discussion has been so rich that I, I will take another round if my if my colleagues, if my uh, speakers allow me to. Um, I I think you know we, we we have a number of people who are also interested to hear a bit further. So uh, I'll take another round of three questions and 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 then we will conclude. Um, I'll start with Abdul Rashid Fido. Uh, please, if you could uh, unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself, and ask your question. Thank you so much, Ahmed. And uh, my, my name is Fido. I am from Anti-Tribalism Movement, which is a UK-based charity. Um, Mahat, Inja, Halima, Abdurshi, thank you very much for your time um, and for the excellent detailed analysis on the election. And, and of course, thank you, Chatham House, for providing this conversation. Um, uh, due to uh, the proxy war, you know, involved in the Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates on one side and Qatar slash, you know, and Turkey on the other side, many Somalis believe the biggest threat to the election may be coming from the Gulf countries. So um, my, my question is actually I would like to put to the, to the panel is how will this proxy war and the foreign intervention impact the credibility of this flawed process? How is this process supposed to be or can remain credible knowing the current administration close and friendly relation with Qatar? And many, many believe Qatar assisted, you know, the elect, uh, to elect the next, then the last two presidents. 
and, and also one minor correction. I will appreciate if uh, there is the term minority in Somali context. I think that it's not correct term because there's nobody has have counted and who's minority, who's major, we have no idea. So I think it's marginalized. These people are marginalized in politics, economy, in, in everywhere. So they're not minority. So let's not leg de uh, legitimize this, this term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fido. Thank you for, for your points and your, and your very astute question. Um, I'll take a couple more. Uh, uh, Mohammed Adam, uh, please, if you would unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Mohammed Adam. I'm from uh, Mogadishu, uh, political science student from Mogadishu. Uh, my question is, is that there were many candidates who were complaining about the uh, committee. So what the next step will be if the candidates boycott the election? My, my next question will be going uh, to... Mohammed. Okay, thank are you, you. Are you directing your question? We only have time for one, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I will ask. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take my last question. Uh, Dimru Bekele, please uh, unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and ask your question. Welcome. Dimro, are you able to speak and introduce yourself? Unfortunately, we're not able to hear you, Dimro. Okay, uh, there's a communication issue there, so I think we're going to have to move on. Uh, unfortunately, Yahya uh, Abdiwali, uh, please do introduce yourself and ask your question. Um, can you hear? Just about, yeah, yeah, please, please try. Do introduce yourself and ask your question. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to work either. Um, okay, uh, I think. Uh, can you hear me? Now? Yes, yeah, yeah, please try, please try and ask your question. All right. Um, my name is Yahya Abdiwali uh, from Magadishu. Um, my question relates with the timetable of the election. Um, given that the uh, previous two administrations failed to hold the election on time uh, and the prospect of history repeating itself being highly likely, uh, what could be the implications if the federal government fails to hold uh, the election on time? And what could that mean for the country? Uh, my, my question is directed at Abdul Rashid and Mahat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yahya. Yeah. Okay, we have our final three questions and, and thank you everybody else who's been patiently waiting. Um, if I may uh, turn to, uh, to uh, Mahad first, uh, I think that last question about the timetable of the elections and what the implications are for the country, not be, them not being held, first, uh, held uh, on time, uh, and, and if they are sub substantially delayed. Uh, what, what, what do you think? Well, thanks, Ahmed, and, uh, and, and thanks, Yahya, for, for the question. This is very important. And, uh, and to be honest, the, the timetable they, they agreed, the, the leaders of the state, the federal member state and the government, and the federal government was not realistic. It, uh, and, and this is very evident that today we don't have even the, the first component of the election, which is uh, the appointment of the, of the election uh, uh, and management teams, which was supposed to, to be appointed between the, the 10th and the 20th of October. And, uh, and now uh, there, there, there are, of course, some reasons behind this. Uh, as far as I know, uh, Buntland and Jubilant has not, uh, have not submitted the list of the, uh, of, of the uh, commissioners and for, for some concerns they have. And, uh, but there is no uh, discussion over where we go from here. And uh, uh, even uh, uh, there is no another, or, uh, another body that, that, that could be uh, the arbiter of this, of this kind of, of things. They are, the seven leaders are the desires of this process. 
they are the, the, the those who, who take the final decision and uh, and they are not coming together if there is a concern uh, over the uh, the appointment of the federal level committee and uh, and some of the states that there should be a discussion on uh, shall we come together again and, and, and discuss this thing and uh, th that's not evident at the moment and and that is what uh, uh, makes uh, technical delay inevitable and it, it's going to happen and uh, and and I think it it, it uh, there will be some some few months uh, uh, before the, the presidential election happens and uh, and within that few months uh, uh, I expect that th there could be either of two. Either they come together and, and decide that the president and the parliament, which they did in 2016, uh, will be uh, a caretaker until a new government, a new parliament and a new president is elected. And that is, that is one possible scenario. And, uh, and the second scenario is that they just keep doing the, implementing the election until the president and the, and the, and the parliament and, and the speakers are elected with tacit approval of, uh, of just extension of, 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 of this. So, but uh, extension is, is inevitable. And, but what is now missing is that uh, if there are concerns that leaders come together again and, and meet and, and discuss going forward. So that is, uh, that's I think one, one missing element at the moment. Thank you very much, Mahad. That's that's a very good answer. Um, I turn to the question uh, uh, that was given by uh, Abd Rashid Fido, and direct that to you, Abd Rashid, uh, about uh, you know I guess the the regional picture, the regional scenario that we see. Um, you know whether or not the Gulf states, uh, the regional states uh, in the Horn of Africa. Uh, have a stake in the Somali elections and what that is going to look like. This is a, you know, a, a question that, that rears its head uh, constantly in Somali uh, political landscape and, and is especially acute during the electoral period. Uh, so to get your thoughts on that would be good. Yes, <clears throat> unfortunately, that's uh, where we are now. And Somali political actors, uh, by way of commission or omission, uh, involve others, uh, you know, uh, to the Somali election. And unfortunately, the season has came where uh, even some individuals might just use uh, the purported, uh, can their purported candidacy as ways of to actually, uh, you know, accumulate resources and, and for reasons and things like that. And it's not only, you know, the Gulf states and their money, but also the neighboring countries and also the international community by way of also omission and, and, and allowing things to back, you know, back slide and sometimes pushing things the wrong way, sometimes uh, ignoring problems that are brewing, sometimes you know, producing you know, uh, statements that does not address the real questions. So I think it's not only you know, some wealth Arab countries giving them some money to some politicians, it happened in the past, it's the Somalis who are doing it. And you know, states, they go after their own interests as usual. But also the international community, the United Nations, the Western countries who have been uh, in the thick of Somali state building and institution building and, and things like that I have also have responsibilities. They more or less actually uh, help it, you know, this indirect election that happened in Dusama Reb and then, you know, culminated in Mogadishu. And it's the onus is also on them uh, to make sure whatever these seven, uh, you know, men regional and federal leaders are, are doing, the international community and the diplomats in Nairobi and in Mogadishu are also part of this. They just cannot disappear when things go south and be part of the center and the front of things when things are being created. They midwifed this agreement in the summer. They, they know that and we know that and Somalis know that. So it's a responsibility to make sure uh, the process is somewhat, you know, uh, at least uh, acceptable now the way it is now it's acceptable i would like to just actually i'd like to disagree with my sister halima but i want to actually you know give a different perspective about al shabab you know coming to the parliament or becoming an mp or the parliament being dominated by al shabab i honestly don't think that's going to happen i don't think that will happen and the reason being 
the current parliament was elected the same way this uh, parliament is being elected. You know, the 2016 and the, the previous years, we don't have Al Shabaab MPs now because Al Shabaab don't to, don't want to become an MP. Maybe if they want to become an MP, as the way they, the way they collect the money and they do transom, if they wanted to become an MP, maybe they can infiltrate. But they have not done that in 20, you know, 16 and 2012, and I very much doubt. Uh, you know, they will also, you know, uh, the next parliament will be made of, of Al Shabaab. I totally think that's a bit, you know, uh, you know, unlikely, likely, uh, and also because of the Somali clans and politicians and individuals are fighting over this. So many, each seat, so many people are fighting over this. So Al Shabaab have their own issues. Uh, they could have done it in the past. They have not done it, and I. I, agree, I understand where Halima is coming from. They get money by force, and if they would, you know, uh, elders, you know, appoint this guy, they can appoint, but they have not done that, so I, I very much doubt they will do it again. So I am not worrying about that, but I'm worrying about uh, an extension that, that's not being agreed, as Mahat said, or, you know, things just dragging out or maybe conflict arising out of this process. So thank you. Thank you, Abdul Rashid. And Halima, I'll turn to you for, for final thoughts. Uh, you know, particularly, I think that was a pertinent question around uh, opposition candidates complaining around uh, about the, the Electoral Commission, uh, you know, the potential for significant and, you know, a, I guess, prominent opposition fig figures not standing in this election due to the way that the, the committee has been uh, put together and the organization has been taken forward. Your thoughts on that and, and, and any concluding thoughts. Thank you. Halima, Halima, you're still on mute for us. You need to unmute. Forget always. Thank you. Yeah, I'm the old, old generation. <laughs> Don't worry, I do the same. I think it doesn't matter what generation you are. You yeah. the anyway, um, thank you um, for the I would have responded in, 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 in a perfect way if I, would, I was managing the election and I had that authority to respond. I, I would have that authority to respond if they do, if a criticism started and the candidates boycott the what would have been. I would have responded because it, we would have prepared a procedure to, to deal with that. So now I cannot answer that, but we have the seven men, as Abushid was saying, point of discrimination when we are saying seven men, and, and they have to deal with it. They have to respond that question and, and, and correct that. Um, for the minority, um, that problem we solved it in Arta in 2000. Somali divided the seats. There is problems within the clan, the distribution of seats. There is problems within the different clans, but that has been solved for a long time. And for the last, and, and since 2000, for the last 20 years, we had a parliament that almost all the Somali clans, where they are minority or not, representing. That issue slightly has been resolved already, but the problem that we have is some um, categories or status, the participation of youth, the participation for women, the participation of um, um, disabled people. That exists still in our in, in Somali parliament, and we have to find solution on that. For women, it's already working. Women are fighting and they are discussing about the issue. And finally, they reach to make them accept 80%, although practically it's not happening. But theoretically, everybody talks about 30%. And the question of Al Shabaab. Yes, maybe in this parliament there's no Al Shabaab. But if we go back, what happened? The elders who elected this parliament 
And what happened, the electoral college, the 51 people who elected the parliamentarian, most of them has been killed. Elders has been killed, electoral college has been killed and still they are dying because of selecting this parliament. And this thinking it's coming when Al Shabab invited the elders to their places and stay there for 45 days, giving them training, talking, to, even they changed their clothes, they gave it them the elders new clothes. He knows Abdrashid, he knows that everybody knows. And when we are talking, some of them they are telling us that we will talk to you about the, the day of the election and you have to follow our rules and regulations. That's where it's coming my my my, my suspicion. And, and things will change at the next parliament. One thing is I know Somali is going ahead slowly. And if you go to capital of Putlangarowe, it's advising, uh, advancing, stability is there, people are working, business is moving. If you come to the Somareb Sin, which is capital of Galmudu, if you go to um, Baidawa, incredible what I have seen there. If you go to Kusmai, the same. Life is going slowly. It's not the way that we were expecting to move, but life is going. And we have that, it's because of the peace that we have. People are not killing each other. Clans are not killing each other. And the only problem that we have is Al Shabaab. So one thing that we have to avoid is fighting. Second, in this election, everybody must be confident, relax, and, and have the ability to run. And, and, and we have to look everything and, and by, by talking each other and solving the problems. There's a problem we have to, to, to solve. As a mother of Somalia, I don't want to go back to the life that I had during the civil war. My life has been destroyed at that time. So I don't want to go back and there are millions of Somali women who are really experiencing that problem. So we are seeking and advising our counterpart men who are the leaders to look again back to Somalia and work towards to the peace. And one thing that I some someone was asking why why we don't have a one person one vote election. In my experience and what I learned and what I have seen I see that the Somalis are very scared on census. Each one, each clan says, I am the majority. The other clan is the minority. So we don't know he, uh, who is majority and who is minority. And when you start talking about census or vote registration, there is some fear. In 1974, in Somalia, and I, I was a student and, 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 and we went out to the country to teach Somalis Somali language. So every student were out there. While we were teaching also, we did a census for the people, for the livestock. It has been collected all, but nobody have seen the results. We don't know where it went, that census. And then in 1986, there was a big census that everybody participated that have been done every region, every district, every village. It was expended a lot of money with the support of, 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 of international community, especially UN. At the end, nobody have seen the result what was the number of, of the Somalis. And now the same, everybody was scared when we say we do vote registration. 
because if I go up GOI and I do the voter registration, it will reflect the population of Afgoy and we will know the population of Afgoy. So that is, unless we came out of that fear, in Somalia cannot happen a fair election. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Halima. And I think actually your, your point, your optimistic, but also a cautionary note, uh, about prioritizing peace and resolving issues through dialogue during the elections, uh, whatever the outcomes may be, whatever the processes are, is a, an extremely pertinent one to end on. Um, I want to thank you, I want to thank Abdul Rashid, I want to thank Mahad, uh, and I want to thank our audience, those participating on Zoom and those joining us via Facebook Live. Uh, for, for being with us and staying with us during this extended session as well. Thank you very much. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to uh, analyze and follow the elections closely. Um, take care and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.